Thank you, both of you. Thank you so much. It's a lonely business to write, and Javin, I'm very, very touched and delighted that that has spurred you on, this, this dark, witchy book has spurred you on. That's wonderful. I look forward to seeing the film when it's ready. Sounds like it'll be ready soon. So, yeah. Uh, as soon as you're ready, let me know. So good to be back. Love this place. I'm feeling... Um, Enchanted and wistful, it's been a while. My old uh, stomping grounds actually grew up on this campus, and so um, it's an amazing thing to return to it, a place of uh, tremendous energy. One of the things that I think was so special for me growing up here um, was realizing over time that I was somewhere where the imagination really mattered and that there was an understanding that both the the imagination that, uh, that leans towards science and the imagination that leans towards art is coming from the same place, a kind of breath of eros, that, um, that place where the creative imagination informs our, our lives and transforms our lives and transforms ultimately the world. So science and art, was very visible while I was growing up, that interest, but also moral life, so the connection between the creative life and moral life but then even further, the connection between creative life, moral life, and, um, and politics. And this place has remained and I think flourished as one of the hot centers on the planet where all these things really matter and continue to inform the world and change the world. So I'm honored and delighted to be here. And I feel you're all so lucky to be studying here. I wish I were among you. <laughs> Well, I thought because Netsuke has been taught um, that I would read from it tonight, but I would, I would also read first a short story that I realized only very recently had fed into this novel. This novel was written very, very quickly, which is not my usual way of working. And I think that is because I had um, completed a collection of short stories called The One Marvelous Thing. And looking at it today, I saw that, in fact, there, there are four stories that fed into this novel, so that the work, in fact, in a way, was being done before, which was why when the novel sees me by the scruff of the neck, it moved very, very quickly. So I'll begin with that short story, and, uh, and it's a fairy tale, so it's very unlike the novel, and it's also from the point of view of the wife, and the wife of Bluebeard. So here goes. It's, it's called uh, Green Air. Is this sound okay? Is this... Grab the wrong book. Green air. Once prized, now she languishes in the drawer, one of many contained within a cedar chest. It stands beneath a window shut against the day. His little dog guards it from intruders. Exactly 12 months ago, they had measured his ballroom together, 666 paces one way, 666 the other. Thriving, they were then, fucking and spending, his kisses tasted like sweet tobacco, and after he gave her pleasure, her sex tasted like tobacco too. She has a matchbox in her pocket, an artifact from when she was the only one, or so she believed, to light his cigar. But now, the victim of his bitter policy, she sighs all day till evening and the long night through, attempting to decipher his robber's mind the reasons for her ritual incubation. Sleepless, she has all the time in the world to recall the looks of doubt and evil that often come to crowd his eyes and for which she once made a thousand excuses. My love, she recalls now with horror, her persistent request, look kindly upon me. Yet he remains aloof, seemingly displeased with a roasted fowl, her failed attempts at conversation, the tenacity of her affection. In her company, he boils over with impatience when he is not deadly weary. She considers that, if some aspire to the realms above the moon, her husband has chosen to dwell beneath it and so shoulder that planet's shadow. Surely it is this that has corrupted his mind and darkened his mood. Yet, in the whore's booths, he rallies, his laughter clattering into the streets like hail. 
Dressed to kill, he takes his ease in unknown places as she staggers under the load of his many inexplicable absences. Still, she persists in her folly. Smile upon me, my beloved, she begs, pressing peaches upon him, the ripest fig. His eyes bright with malice, his snorted amusement frustrates her virtue. With real longing, she watches his beautiful hand stroke down his beard. When for the last time he kisses her, he viciously bites her tongue. As the blood spills down her chin, he expulses her from their bed and drags her thrashing to the cedar chest, although she cries out, No, no, for I am no crone, but in the heat of youth, even the beetles, she shrieks, move freely about. The insignificant snails, the tent pitchers, the camel drivers, even the serpents make their way beneath the sun, the cool of dawn. The first night locked away, she notices how outside in the streets the hubbub decreases before ceasing altogether. Sprinkled with blood, the others in the chest are silent. Silence their sobs, their barking tongues. The winter is a bitter one. No one recalls such cold. Catching a whiff of smoke from the merchant's coffee fire, she lights a match. For an instant, the world is kinder. There in the drawer, she is taught the final lesson. Her nature, humble, generous, kind, does not assure interest or compassion. Her one hope that her dreadful condition may turn out to be unforeseen luck of a kind. Something might come of it. The ways of the world are mysterious. Something, dare she imagine it, wondrous. This is what the little dog had said. His tail held high, his eyes like two saucers, each set with a black yoked egg. Wait and see, wait and see. Something wondrous will come. The drawer is the only place where it could have ended because that is where it all began. Or rather, to be more precise, where she came upon the artifacts that caused her to consider that something was going on, and not only in her head, mind you, that the marriage so new, barely begun, the prior's wife's body still warm, was a figment, and the drawer, as are all things belonging to husbands, was strictly taboo as were his pockets holding small silver and keys, taboo. But then one day, sweetly occupied by the innocence of her own wifely tasks, the house flooded with light, she found herself propelled towards the very drawer in which she now languishes. It was the fault of the little dog, you see, until then always so uncannily quiet, who at once began to raise a ruckus with all its throat, calling and calling out to her, Come, look at this, insisting, Come, here, look at this. And then it happens. She goes to the chest, her heart thrashing, not only because what she is about to do is forbidden, but because what she is about to find will change everything. A box of gold rings, his sharp pencils and pens, the small brass instruments with which he navigates the streets, a box of matches she pockets without thinking, and she finds some little sticks meant to keep his shirt collars stiff. It is prodigious how, in the morning, he arises an old man, suffering desolation of mind as though in the night he had seen firsthand, perhaps even participated in, all the horror of the world, only to step into the shower, his dressing room, and so transform himself into a prince. Glad-eyed, he leaves the breakfast nook with a lion's muscled ease, sweetening her mind with longing throughout the day as the sun lifts and lowers in the deepening sky. Ah, but what can this be? Deep in the drawer, she finds two little books coming unglued and held together with string. You found us, they cheer up so shrilly she is startled. High time, high time. Raising their covers, they fly directly into her hands, and the little dog, prancing on his hind legs, he too cries out, High time, high time. It is hard to remove the string. Her hands are shaking so. The first book, the one on top, is familiar to her. It contains the names of the ship they sailed together on their brief honeymoon, the cities they visited, Pisa, Pompeii, the names of hotels, a list of gardens, museums, and she recalls all those distant places where it had seemed they had been madly in love, although everything written with his thick-nibbed pen and ink as black as tar. But now the second book shudders with such eagerness beneath the first she must attend to it at once. This book contains her husband's dreams, and it thrusts and rages into her heart. There are a number of dreams, any number of dreams, about E. E in the green dress is how the dream begins. 
E in the green dress, laughing. E the dress now pushed above her legs, above her ass, and he the dreamer, the one who is her husband, fucking E, fucking E's cunt, E's ass. E naked on a green couch in a green room. Why is everything green? How can her own terrible jealousy color a dream about which she knew nothing? How can it be that this venomous air, this green air, that she is forced to breathe because there is no other air, is the dream's primary color? In the dream, E says, I'll fuck you till you weep, but it is she, the one who is betrayed, who is weeping. Outside, the snow is falling. She has only one match left to light and so decides to save it. Nearly dead with cold, his dreams scramble into her mind like ferrets they will not let her be. He fucks a woman briefly encountered, a pale woman with hazel eyes flecked with gold. Yes, how fascinating women are. She can appreciate this in all their variety. Flecked with gold, her white forehead is smooth as the egg of an ostrich, her breasts too heavy and white. A woman she recognizes as someone she had once offered a perfect cup of tea in those days not long ago when she lived full of grace and wandered freely in rooms now impossible to reach. This woman, she vividly recalls, he fucks in a brothel within a maze or catacomb that extends beneath the Tower of Pisa, or maybe it is Pompeii because there are ashes falling all around them. He chokes upon them. She chokes upon them. Her husband's dreams are all fucking dreams. He fucks his own sons, the one who is lame, the club-footed son, the halting son, Have I hurt you, he asks in the dream. Have I hurt you, he insists, dreaming. But his sons do not speak. Their place in the dream belongs to silence. A year unfolds reduced to letters of the alphabet and the colors of things dreamed. Black ashes, a white body, the green weather within a room. In the final entry, he is fucked by someone terrifying. He has no idea who. Without color or letter, she is a shadow as filthy as death and collapses heavily upon him. A shroud, he wonders. Has he been fucking beneath the shadow of death all along? Could it be that simple? The cold is too intense to bear, and she is forced to light her last match. Its heat and clarity offer her a moment of hope at once snapped up and swallowed. Hugging her knees, she falls into a dream of her own, a dream that, like all her dreams these days, comes to her like a malefic visitation from some lethal galaxy. In her dream, they are standing together by the side of a country road, one somehow familiar. A movie screen has been set up in a ditch, and E, the E of the green dress, stands behind a projector showing a snuff film. The images smear the screen like a filthy water. She wants to turn away, but he forces her to look, holding her wrists behind her back, as when inexplicably his lovemaking had become cruel. Her head and eyes, too, are immobilized so that she cannot look away, will forever be forced to see what he could not help but see, all those things he saw night after night in those terrible dreams of his. Outside, in the winter streets, people come and go on their way home with wheels of yellow cheese and fruit of all colors imported from distant places. She hears the sounds of the fruit vendors calling and, overwhelmed with longing, imagines what it would be like to bite into a red fruit freshly picked and brimming with juice. It comes to her that if leprosy is rampant in the region, it is because the gods in their legions are unquenchable. So what I've done is um, pull some, um, pull a number of things from the novel, sort of pulling through very quickly from the start towards the end, and uh, without entering into um, the wife's story, I think I think there there may some be some passing references, but um, but directly into the psychoanalyst story, which engages a uh, story that engages um, so many, so very many people. Although it is still very early, the wealth of the day is upon him. He is running. He is listening to Monteverde, and he is running. He is very muscled and lean. He lopes along, hungry as a wolf. There is something regal about the canopy of leaves above him. The sun has only just lifted over the rim of the world. His days are made up of what he calls real time and the interstices. 
Real time provides an identity, a footing. The interstices, however, provide him with a life. The sun begins to spill onto the path. He runs dappled with light. Hooked to Monteverde, he doesn't hear the birds riding in the trees. He runs like a creature of the woods before the world truly began, long before the first great cities of the world had ever been conceived. He is aware of his sex when he runs. There is a pretty woman, surely half his age, running toward them, toward him. As they are about to pass one another, his eyes leap into hers. She slows down and turning, runs backwards, looking at him. When he glances over his shoulder, she bursts into laughter. A gentle breeze lifts. The day shimmers with the music of Monteverde. Still laughing, she turns away and runs into the trees. It is like a movie, maybe an animated cartoon. He playing the centaur to her nymph. Yes, that's it, a centaur. In an instant, the world compresses into one point of heat and light. Off the path now, deep in the trees, they begin to devour one another's tongue and teeth, panting each time they surface for air. He pushes her up against a tree and takes her. She burns at the center of his life. He will never weary of fucking her. She rides him. He rides her. She drowns. He swims into her depths. She cries out. She trembles. She says, wow, and laughs again, but very quietly. He emerges from her and with a graceful, almost imperceptible gesture, rearranges his cock. He hesitates a moment. He tenderly brushes her cheek with the back of his hand and says, sorry, sweetheart, I've got to go to work. Yeah, she nods and beams down at him as he fumbles with the lace of his sneaker. She sighs. She too pulls herself together. So what's work? She asks lightly, not wanting to appear overly curious, needful. Psychoanalysis, he says, eager now to get on his way. He thinks she looks like a kid, her straw-colored hair barely holding in a rubber band, a sweet-looking kid, a daisy among the many of the field. Bye, sweetheart, he says, and off he goes, turning once to smile at her and wave, a gesture charming, attentive, and yet, hey, she calls out after him. He is vanishing down the path. Hey! Theirs is a big city. Back home, he showers and works up a lather. He's Neptune in a sea of foam. He is a god leaping from the interstices back to the real world. He recalls it for the gods. The real world was, in fact, the interstices, a playground, a mirror of the heavens, a theater. Each morning after his run is like this, he in a lather, reflecting, pummeled by water. He will stay in the shower for an hour, making himself over, making himself new. The process, he thinks, is alchemical. Today he is feeling especially philosophical. He considers the nature of women, the daisies of the field, so fuckable, so breakable. The ones who call out, hey, and stamp their feet in irritation, like mares. The ones who blossom early, only to succumb to nerves. Those who startle easily and sour in an instant love with them is like sucking lemons. The lazy, careless women in need of pedicures who, when darkness falls, can be seen lolling about unkempt in tapas bars. The aging actresses, their sweet vulnerabilities on parade. Incandescent alcoholics as troublesome as fever dreams, fantastic in the early hours of the evening, but only then. The chameleons, the gorgeous exotics prone to outbursts of temper. The luscious North Africans, their balaclava pussies. The antelope who cannot settle down, a good fuck on an airplane, taxi cab, the train. The new mistress one fucks before sitting down to dinner with one's wife. The women who give courage, these are rare. The wild ones with magenta manes who wear boots in all seasons. The whore who brought down Enkidu, who showed him the things a woman knows how to do. The tribal types who like sex in clusters, the women who at Christmas consider suicide, the frisky ones, the ones who talk too much, the ones who kill with silence, the risk takers, the ones with big ideas, the death cunts who kill with a look, the tender ones, the fayaways like islands, who love in cautious isolation, who rub one's feet, they have juicers, One abandons them judiciously, all the while cooing like a dove. The clients whom one fucks in the name of a unique experiment. The wives whom one betrays extravagantly. The current wife, Akiko. 
the one for whom the interstices were superseded, if only briefly, by the real, Akiko, whose beauty no longer troubles his sleep. His world is mazed with cunts, and he has not yearned for hers in centuries. An old prince of darkness, this is what he has become. His teeth worn to the gums, his tongue swollen with overuse, his cock like his heart close to breaking. My practice belongs to a shelf in the devil's kitchen. Insulated, above suspicion, I take my pleasure and am sustained by the sorrow of others, their carnality, the ceaseless ebb and tide of human inconstancy, negligence, cowardice. In the world I know everyone is betrayed sooner or later. The practice is not of my own making. I mean, it is an inheritance of a kind. I have wandered its maze since infancy. I do not know another way to live. I often wish I did. The practice is the inevitable extension of my own private dilemma. It is lethal, and yet without it I would perish. Assiduously, I portion out its poisons. Assiduously, I orchestrate the days. Like a game of chess, the practice proposes an infinite set of circumstances, or rather, not exactly infinite, for I begin to, and this admission is terrifying, to see how redundant, how compressed the games are. My, my clients are thwarted, famished, lonely. Inevitably, sooner or later, I seize upon and penetrate the one who has wanted this from me from the first instant, or has taken time but has come around to wanting it. For a client, fucking the doctor is always perceived as a triumph, although I'm always curious from the start. In this way, I am made. If the client is attractive, I cannot help but wonder, is she he fuckable? An outrageous determination, and yet fucking is the one determinism, the one inevitability. In this way, it is exactly like death. You know you'll fuck, be fucked, you know you'll die, and maybe be murdered, and maybe murdered. I have known transcendent sex, but its promise frightens me. The risks of delight are immense. The infant feeding at the mad woman's breast, slipping deliciously in and out of slumber, is fiercely smacked. Smacked when he sups, he is quickly weaned. In no time he has learned to suck up, bite, and wean. Always watchful for the hook, he travels deep into the world of men with his deft set of sharpened tools. He will become a hoodlum a maniac, a soldier. He will become a priest, a prison guard, a cop, a dogmatist, a patriarch, decidedly a public danger. He will become a psychoanalyst. He will have a practice. He will learn to dissemble. He will laugh like a wolf. He will cut through the city streets like a blade through water. His realm will be the streets, their secret stores of pleasure, their secret doors. I have a drawer full of keys, opening to wondrous rooms, unfamiliar rooms, shabby rooms. He is attracted to, appalled by, shabby rooms. The street boy's spare depot, the shop girl's cluttered cheese box, the saturated confusion of the drag queen's aviary, her floor slick with hairspray and powder. He must take care to shed these scents, to kick the dust up behind him before returning home. Unlike a female client, a man in a wig, a boy smelling of malnutrition, are not likely to hire a lawyer. I leave clues behind both purposefully and inadvertently, inadvertently because I do not wish to be discovered. I do not wish to hurt Akiko, his wife. There is a self within me who longs, at least from time to time, if more and more sporadically, to live a simple, tender life, or if this is beyond my powers, to engage the interstices with discretion, without harming Akiko, yes, without bringing her to harm. Purposefully, because I long to be discovered, as I always have since infancy, to receive the punishment that is my due, to risk annihilation, I court annihilation. Deception is tiresome. It begins to seriously leech my resources, my strength, my powers of intellect, my time. And because there is a self within me who would crush Akiko's gentle neck, who knows, perhaps one day we will die together in a conflagration, our own conflagration in a world that is everywhere burning. The practice is contained within two home cabinets situated at the entrance of our property, but my clients do not know there is a house beyond nestled in the woods, a Kiko's studio as well as invisible. 
Perched upon the edge of a small ravine, both appear to soar above the canopy. From within our rooms, Akiko notices and points out to me the deer, the snowy owls, and seasonal hummingbirds. The home cabinets are well rooted to the ground by a stone path and garden, all of Akiko's design. My wife is addicted to perfection and adheres to a dogmatic system, both ancient and alien to me, and beneficial. In terms of my need to dissemble, she is my greatest gift. The cabinets are impeccably set out. They are spare and they are superb. Each has its own waiting room. The cabinets both open to a hallway that leads to my own private library and office. One of the cabinets I call spells. I cannot enter it without my heart beating faster. The other I call drear. If spells is devoted to the pleasures of transgression, drear belongs to all the rest. Lutherans, a defrocked priest, a wafer-thin old maid, a psychopath, who has bungled more surgeries than he has toes, the retired night watchman who squanders his pension on whores and whose wife of 40 years is suing for divorce. There is also the CEO of a local company undoubtedly responsible for my city's dramatic number of birth defects, a college professor, the most tedious of the bunch, who drones on and on about a lost inheritance and his wife's dismal affair with a family dentist. There was once a young scholar I took a fatherly interest in and who managed to elicit real tenderness. Do not think me incapable of tenderness. Sometimes a client will move up from drear to spells, even after many years. There was an actress once as rageful as a bloody axe, who over time was soothed and then began, it seemed miraculous, to flourish. One day I saw how beautiful she had become, how vigorous, how eager for the world and its delights, how desirous also of transgression. I invented an excuse, excuse claimed Drear needed to be reconfigured and moved her to spells. There I allowed her to seduce me. I always, she told me on her knees, wanted this. The affair triggered a shift in her expectations and charisma. She landed a major role downtown. That was 10 years ago. And if her roles are now less glamorous, she still invites me to opening nights. Spells is a theater where my clients and I break all the rules, and this under the banner of mindful subversion, convulsive beauty. What happens there is stunning, somehow always unique, if orchestrated. I never forget that I am dealing with people who, despite their determinisms, their needful tenderness, their pride, can at any moment decide to kill me or call their lawyers. And so spells is oiled with solicitude and sweetness and the infinite capacity that seems to be mine to convey that each transgression is unprecedented. To assure this impression, I have at times and after a period of months or weeks revealed a previous violation many, many years before when I was green and still vulnerable. Such a revelation convinces the most skeptical of my good intentions, my passionate interest in them, and the anomaly our, lo our love affair represents. The lady in question, now mistress, will assure me that my secret is safe with her, as safe as she believes she is with me. The affair remains circumscribed within the process of recovery. I do not accept gifts apart from the little love gifts, so like those of high school girls, I simply cannot refuse. I explain that because our lovemaking is an extension of our work together, the fee will be the same. In this way, I become my client's whore. Yet I always manage to act professionally, my infatuations are in the service of knowledge. My clients love this. We fuck in the stellar radiance of knowledge and love. I am enamored of my profession. The women are intelligent, sexy, neurotic, funny, inventive, feisty, sprightly, and they are in need of me. They do yoga, tai chi, they are in fine fettle and in great shape. They play tennis, they go to the sporting club, they get massages and go to Botox parties. They are as sleek as seals. The men, this is more complicated. Mary, how is our time? I, I timed this, but I'm, is it okay? So I'm leaping ahead. Uh, I'm going to leap ahead to uh, one of the male clients. Let's see. Um, you fill a house with precious things, they break. You fill a heart with precious things, it breaks. In the end, it all breaks. All night long, I hear bones snapping. My nights are my star chamber. 
In my dreams, the elusive sweetness of the world is just around the corner up a tree, waiting in the silver tower at the top of a mountain, in a box secreted at the bottom of the sea, in the flame of Aladdin's lamp. And always between these legs, or maybe those, the divine secret of sweetness. Is it, I wonder, the same sweetness that seizes the fish when it spills its sperm, and the tigers when they fuck, the serpents as they coil and uncoil, thrashing in the mud together, Could it be that this elusive sweetness is at the heart of everything, coupling, striving for delight, as once in Tahiti, Samoa, such places? Late in the day, I received a call from a man named David Swancourt, a young man most likely, with an unusually engaging voice, disquieting, restless, intimate. Intrigued, I played his inquiry over a number of times before returning his call, I managed to reach him at once, and we made an appointment for the following Friday in the new office. He's not satisfied anymore with the two offices he has near his home and uh, is moving to another place downtown. David Swancourt was scheduled for the afternoon Already I had broken my rule for Friday, which was to keep the afternoon open for affairs of the heart. Hold on a second, I think I'm... (laughs) I did this whole sort of um, collaging of... uh... Yeah, I guess it's okay. (laughs) Sorry. Um, So this is another, another patient he's remembering. Until recently, the cutter had taken up the entire afternoon. We would go off together to the coast or up in the hills outside of town. When Akiko was away, our Fridays extended into long, luxurious weekends. Kat could be tender. She liked it when we could stroll together hand in hand like any regular couple. What if, she said, on one of these marvelous interludes we shared in the interstices of our lives, what if I am the one to domesticate Bluebeard? Bluebeard, I said, astonished that she could think such a thing of me, let alone say it with such spontaneity, even gaiety. Whatever makes you think I'm anything like that? Oh, come on. She stopped walking and dropping my hand, turned to face me. You love that filthy shit. I was lost. I considered. I thought she meant anal sex. I said, you love it too. Not as much as you. I thought you were crazy for it. Are we talking about the same thing? Kat asked, knowing a cuticle spangled in the sun. Maybe not. I'm talking about the videos, baby. That sick shit. Oh, God, that. I felt at once as if my skull was being compressed. Even now recalling this terrible pressure returns, it persists. Before the cutter, I had never actually seen a snuff film. But early on in our sessions together, she had insisted, for reasons still unclear to me, that I watch one with her. In fact, the first time I spent a night with her in her place, we had seen one, the first of many. The films had colored our affair and had, I can see it now, seeped into the hours and minutes of my life. Yes, such things can change the nature of time because the films were the unspooling of my most private nightmares. This is what the cutter gave me, free access to my own abyss. In a session, one has access to the invisible. The visible presents itself in costume with attitude. The client arrives dressed for the occasion, self-protective, guarded, hopeful, prepared to be seductive, wanting to be impressive, for her story to matter, to be unique, wanting her pain to be perceived as exemplary, important, meaningful. Most often a woman will arrive perfumed. Even if her heart has been torn from her chest, she will step into the office with freshly washed hair. Even if she is on the verge of suicide, she will present herself in her best shoes. She may question whether or not she should paint her face because she knows that if she weeps, she'll make a mess of it. A guy will wear a clean shirt, a suit or tie. He may press his jeans. The first time the cutter showed up, she was wearing five-inch heels and jeans so tight I thought, uh, so tight I could see the swell of her mons pubis. In other words, she presented as a woman who was fuckable and that her fuckability mattered to her more than anything else. David Swancourt burns into the cabinet like a flame. And when he leaves, I will look down at the carpet and imagine it has been scorched. 35, tall, slender, a full mouth, an intense expression about the eyes. When he looks at me, it's like having my genitals grabbed. A good straight nose, good bones, 
soft brown hair cut at the shoulders, overall a feral ease. A man who sighs, a man who paces, who steals across the room as though on skates. A man I cannot help but watch with a certain fascination. A man fully aware of his beauty, a man I find beautiful. Unlike the cutter, David Swancourt is enigmatic, perhaps a chimera. There is a heat to him, a heat that matches my own. He reminds me of my youth except for this difference. He knows about this heat of his whereas I did not know, did not understand its implications, its possibility until later. It took me two marriages to understand and acknowledge it, a third to follow its imperatives. I wish I had known sooner. I would not have wasted so much time. I would have been a smoother player from the start. Yet, despite all this, I also see his insecurities. These two are like my own. I know he will tell me about chaotic sex, that like me he is driven to sex, that he is deeply humiliated by the imperiousness of this need, its rabid character, a need that bites and sees and will not settle. I know that he prides himself in his endless exploits, the fact of all that smoke and sulfur he has shared with so many, those countless others, each so different, and yet, when push comes to shove, the same. A body opens like a flower, like a wound beneath the assassin's knife, a street hit by a grenade. This is how it was, even before the rest was revealed. I began at once to read him, to devour him with my eyes, as he paced, this man so like myself, so fearless, so afraid, so famished, so incapable of nourishing himself. Above his left eye, there was a scar that drove into his eyebrow. Beneath it, that eye of his tore into the room. It was an angry eye, a timid eye, an eye sucked nearly dry with fear. Unlike his other eye, the right one, the eye that showed how smart he was, how funny he could be, how playful, how inventive. His right eye was brown and brimming with humor, and then I saw that rarity. His left eye was blue. I marveled that I did not notice this at once, a cold eye, a hot eye. Here was one curious fish. He had been pacing for 10, 15 minutes. At last, he dropped down into the other eames. He said, I've never been in a room like this before. How so? He smelled of leather and citrus. He smelled of earth. I noticed his boots, a bit the worse for wear, caked with dry mud, and his fingernails needed attention. It's a beautiful room. He shook his head and frowning stood up. How he roamed about, how he wheeled and soared, rose and fell. One minute a kestrel, the next a carp. Swancourt, I said, is an unusual name, it seems. As I searched for the right word, he returned from his wanderings and once again sat down. Unprecedented. He laughed disdainfully. His gaze continued to drift. Each and everything in the room caught his attention, but only briefly, and then he'd rip into me with those schizophrenic eyes. He turned to the Netsuke cabinet, and there he lingered. His profile caught me by the throat. There are faces that have the attraction of stars, studded with star eyes, eyes that have a gravitational field. These are the eyes of those who are not only close to the edge, but who have already gone over the edge, perhaps cyclically, a chronic habit with them. And yet they have managed to return. The soles of their feet are scarred by fire. They have eaten glass. They have bedded down with snakes. They will do anything, anything at all to stop a certain kind of pain, which is the pain that comes to a person whose spirit has been so sullied and downtrodden. The best it can do is shine forth fitfully like a firefly fought within a, caught within a fist in the throes of a kind of final frenzy and in the face of death. These are the people who make for thrilling lovers. Invariably, their attraction is compromising. The risk is immense. But one is like them. One is willing to risk everything, if only to burn brightly for a moment. The world is full of people such as this, people raging with hunger who may at any instant implode. Our planet is studded with such black holes. I have considered developing a cosmology of this ruinous eroticism. David Swancourt was looking directly into my face. I think this room is too beautiful for someone like me. Perhaps not beautiful enough, I said. He pointed to his boots. I walked here from the bus station. I've left mud all over your carpet. I don't care, I said. But you must be very thirsty. I stood up. How about a Perrier? A Perrier, he laughed. Was he mocking me? 
I brought it to him nonetheless and watched as he polished it off thirstily. When the bottle was empty, he set it down and standing said, So, this is how it begins. It has already begun. Yeah, said David Swancourt. I guess so. I'd say it has. For the briefest of moments, he lashed at me with his eyes, with such unbridled ferocity, I thought, watch out. That's it. Thank you. (laughs) Thanks so much for coming. fairy tales as a child, and I return to them on occasion, so I've written a number of fairy tales. But, you know, the process is very mysterious, Um, and um, and I don't I don't really know what what sets things off, because I think I think things are percolating for a very long time before they, you know, they they begin to surface and demand a book or a a part of a book or whatever. Um, So I don't really know why fairy tale, but that happened one day, and it was Bluebeard, and I realized the little match girl had come together, and um, that was the unraveling in the story. But I hadn't noticed, and what's so odd, maybe says something about how dopey I am, really, because I had not noticed the profound connection between that story and this novel until just a few weeks ago. So, and it's just so obvious. It was just a whole other process by the time I got to the novel. Sort of embarrassing. I mean, it sounds like it's just one is so well, irresponsible and <laughs> unfettered. Anybody else? Thanks so much. <laughs> <laughs>